Okay, just a wee tad on the uptake. Welcome to Evolution Hour. We're getting started a couple minutes late. Our clicky clacks and typewriters. I'm as old as the typewriter. Give me some slack. And um, there is our logo. TortukanWordPress.com. Troubles in Paradise, the methodology of creationism. We are now on the air, and if I can click off any things here, we will stop sharing, and I can shut that down and get on with the uh, the show there. Oh, howdy, gang. <laughs> uh, I see Brian in the live chat uh, has got uh, Evolution Slam Dunk, which I will hold up to the charming camera. Everybody ought to have Slam Dunk, A, because I can use the royalties, and B, because it's one hell of a book. Um says he's on page 83, catching the sense of the metapleural gland, his next section on the read. Uh, yeah, that's all on uh, ant evolution, where I go into some of the problems that Michael Denton, the intelligent designer, did in his uh, recent anti-evolution book. And uh, uh, Denton is a strange character. I've met him finally in a speech that he gave, uh, pushing one of his new books over in Seattle. And he functionally acknowledged that I was right on my criticism without really acknowledging that that meant he was wrong. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> oh, Brian says uh, his sister got it for uh, Christmas. Well, thank you, thank your sister for me, uh, for uh, getting the book for you. And uh, when you're all done with it, make sure you get a good, uh, uh, clear and honest review of it on uh, Amazon, saying that you got it as a gift and so forth and so on. Anyway, um, we uh, are continuing with our magnificent, exciting world of, um, uh, Rupi and Sanford's Contested Bones book, which uh, I have been analyzing these many, 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 many moons. Uh, they are young earth creationists, but they don't really talk about the young earth creationist -y part and uh, are insisting that um, the evidence for human evolution is faulty. Uh, a reader, a listener of my shows uh, offered to send me the book because he didn't want to have to go through analyzing it. So I'm going through it source by source, source methods. Uh, it didn't have an index. It didn't have a bibliography. So I've had to construct all of that and uh, measuring out how they're dealing with the sources. Whenever possible, I like to indicate the primary sources that you can follow up on yourself. Uh, if it's just a, a, a non, um, uh, it's just an abstract, that could be awkward. Uh, I want you to be able to read the whole thing. And uh, they're just finishing up their chapter on Australopithecus sediba which is a little interesting taxon that exists fairly late enough in the game that there's a big dispute about how close they are to the homo line. And uh, most of the paleoanthropologists think that they have a much more important implication. It's showing how um, mosaic and varied the Australopithecines were because they had uh, features that were more ape-like than some of the Australopithecines and more human-like than some of the Australopithecines. Rupi and Sanford and the creationists simply say, no, they're just a couple different animals muddled together. Unfortunately, the paleoanthropologists are a little better at that. And um, uh, Rupi was wholesale avoiding the content of the technical literature all through the book. They're still running at about uh, half of the work is just authority quoting. And um, of their about a third of their sources are technical materials, not a huge amount. Um, it's only like 150 or so, so far, not a, uh, a, a colossal amount. But um, of that, about half of it is questionably misrepresented. And uh, that would include a couple of the papers that I put up here where they end their chapter going after the geology of a particular site where the Sediba uh, was found, this particular cave. And um, um, th the creationists deny that the geology is correct, that the idea that this was a one time a long time ago in a cave system and that there were sinkhole things where people, the uh, careers could drop down and that this is known in other geological contexts in the papers that they cited in their own work uh, went into this in considerable detail. And they talked about other examples and none of that information gets popped up. But the one that I really blew overboard on um, was the idea that um, they made a great deal about the fact that flowstone is involved in this and there had been erosion since and they, they were the, it's an interesting issue of how they worked out the geology of the area. But the creationists are arguing the pit of bones could also reflect a sinkhole, a deep pond, the steep sides where animals would drown. Another possibility is that the animals were hunted and after consumption, the remains were buried and preserved. 
except that doesn't fit the actual taxa. Uh, they get the things wrong. They took the number of fossils they, that Murphy and Sanford got wrong. They call they say there were thousands, but that no, there were thirteen hundred altogether. That's not more than one thousand. Uh, that um, uh, they said that were primate fossils. In fact, there was only one partial skull of what might be a primate. All the other uh, were hominids. This, these examples of these sediba. Uh, no, it was a fascinating example of uh, Rupi and Sanford once again muddling the information. And I put the link up to the two papers um, uh, the, um, uh, on the, uh, the geology of the area from, I think, 2015 and, and 2013. So they're quite recent. Uh, oh, I ironically, even Rupi got, got the date of one of the technical papers wrong. He listed it as 2013 when it's actually 2015. Um, oh, people uh, enjoying the warmth uh, wherever they are in, in the um, uh, live chat. Um, it's uh, modestly cold here in Spokane, but nothing at all like the freezing bone chill that's going on in the east. Uh, uh, I hope you don't mind, but they're getting our weather. Uh, because we've had a relatively mild um, bit uh, in here in Spokane. Uh, there was just a little bit of snow. I didn't even have to shovel any of it, which is relatively atypical. You usually have to shovel a little bit of snow every year. And in the old days, it was like three feet of snow. My back remembers it back in the 60s and 70s. So um, this climate change thing is altering to my benefit. I probably won't ever have to have a snow thrower machine uh, because we won't get snow in town this much. But minor, minor digression on matters of, uh, of climate change and all that, although it is a methods issue. But the neat thing about the um, paleoanthropology uh, on, um, uh, and the sources that they cite, uh, you can read a couple generic articles, one uh, in the uh, New York Times that um, uh, Rupi glommed onto for some authority quotes. He always glommed onto only the stuff that's when nicked out of context was unfavorable to the argument that they wanted um, to dismiss. Uh, but you can read the whole thing and find out, no, there's a lot more information in there. And also a National Geographic one that was really about the next chapter in the line, which is Homo naledi, which we'll be getting to in future weeks. But um, it's from um, the um, October 2015 issue, and I put the linkage up to it. But again, Rupi just nicked a tiny little thing out of it where they were uh, talking about Berger's uh, Australopithecus sediba and how it was based on newer material, more marginalized in terms of how it fit into the evolutionary tree than it was when it was first found. By the way, the technical material on this, these newer material are from the same Berger guy. So uh, they really have to be very parsy about, uh, the creationists have to be extremely parsy about what sort of material they're bringing up with. Uh, and that's why it's really important to always look at the primary source material in this area. Um, so I'll thank Brian on the fact that he's now got my uh, evolution slam dunk. Uh, I, there's not a great deal on human evolution in it, uh, it the, because I was dealing with the reptile mammal transition. We allude a little bit to it, but uh, the reptile mammal transition goes all the way back a quarter of a billion years and down into the Mesozoic where mammals are coming along at about the same time as dinosaurs are late. Triassic. So it, it's a, a, a much older time frame. Uh, in the new book that um, uh, Jackson Wheat and I are doing, the rocks are still there. There'll be a bunch of stuff on human evolution in a variety of contexts. Uh, he's uh, again working today, so he wasn't able to join uh, today, but I'll give the, the plug to the grand project. Uh, it's, uh, it's going to be applying to the Answers in Genesis creation books uh, the same method that I was using here in the uh, Evolution Slam Dunk book. And uh, it, it's looking like it's going to be really juicy because uh, the answers book haven't been properly criticized, uh, even online. There's been only scattershot criticism of isolated points. And I thought we'd be, and I agree with Jackson, it'd be a useful thing to pull together um, a comprehensive takedown of their various books. And he, uh, we're dealing with about four or more of them and then a variety of attendant material, including intelligent design stuff, because intelligent design people tread some of the same dangerous gangplanks that the uh, young earth creationists do. So the upshot of the, um, uh, the Sediba chapter is a long litany of data selection on the part of the creationists. Um, Over-reliance on secondary sources, a failure to look into the details of the papers they cite, uh, so data suppression is just rampant in there. And of course, the failure to work through really kind of what their model is, when are things happening? Um, that uh, Sanford is a young earth creationist, but he's not 
arguing young earth creationism. And one thing that didn't show up at all is the creationist literature. Ironically, that applied because there was a paper of um, uh, Todd Wood, I think, who did a baromenology analysis that included Australopithecus sediba, which he ended up lumping with Homo habilis and the humans as the human holobaromen, probably because of the human characteristics of the skulls and things like that. <clears throat> and it's interesting that as pathologically thorough as Rupi has tried to be to dismiss every possible niche of the evolution thing, that he doesn't seem to pay any attention to what creationists have said on the subject, that uh, Australopithecus sediba has been falling into the uh, human hollow um, the, uh, the The problem is, is you've got a series of characteristics <clears throat> that modern humans have and a series of characteristics that basal primates have. And in order to get from one to the other, you have to eventually acquire all of those. And they don't have to happen all at once. They can be incremental. And that's the one of the big blind spots that you find in anti-evolution literature is they, they will note anything that's ape-like in an ancestral form or more human-like in the form and tunnel vision in on that to say if it's got a human characteristic, well, that's just a human being. And if it's ape-like, then, oh, it's just an ape. But they don't look at all the suite of information together. Uh, there's new work that's popping up all the time now uh, in the paleogenomics field that um, we'll be dealing with uh, in uh, coming years, where they're working out retro-engineering what's going on in ancestral hominids. And because we've got a snippet of data in terms of the genetics, in terms of archaic humans and Neanderthals and Denisovans. And you can see now more and more about the trajectory of how biological systems alter in terms of skull shape and bone size and all the rest, that it's only a matter of time that they're gonna be getting more and more into paleogenomic reconstruction, for example, of why the Neanderthal uh, anatomy is as different as it is. And when you have that benchmark, then you can anticipate what ancestral forms must have been around between them and our group in Homo erectus. And it's it's going to be an interesting field. And there, there's going to be more and more data for people to go. <clears throat> and we have a, a long side conversation going on over there. I, I, I'm losing you, gang, uh, that uh, because they're talking about the weather out there. Admittedly, uh, I... Um, uh, They've got to sympathize with all the people out there. They're, they're, they're having to shut schools down uh, or failure to. I think one of the weathermen on NBC, uh, Al Roker, was complaining that the governor of Kentucky wasn't closing the schools down um, in the face of, the, of this extreme cold because little kids can get frostbitten in no bloody thing at all. And, and in the places up in, in Wisconsin and that where you've got minus 60 and things like that without a wind chill, uh, it, it, this is going to be very, very bleak. Um, Beach is uh, saying, seems to me the real scientists take decades debating where a species fit, but creationists can make up their minds in uh, in minutes. And uh, uh, if they, the problem is they're not really making up their minds. They haven't actually worked out a detailed model of what they think is going on. And so it's a scattershot. Um, there are various analysts, and we're going to be calling attention to it in the new um, Rocks book, where the creationists can't quite make up their mind where some of these taxa belong, that over time, various creationists have made snap judgment opinions as to what they kind of felt. And so Neanderthals got dragged into the humans fairly easy on, and then all the Australopithecines and everything else have got to be pushed off the map into, into the ape category. Um, so uh, uh, it's fun to follow what little systematics is being done in the creationist thing, just on the human evolution part. And of course, the one thing they never, ever, ever, ever specify is what the fossils would need to look like for them to say, well, now that's a transitional. They, they never identify what they would accept. So it's only a matter of how much can they parse the data field to reject stuff. Um, now, if you're looking down in the grassroots creationist level, the, the bottom feeder types, they actually are more prone to the kind of snap judgmenty thing, uh, BJ. Uh, they're um, uh, are relying upon secondary sources, which, of course, is what we'll be getting into in the second half of the show uh, on uh, uh, some of the fascinating bit, the Wasserberger quote and uh, stuff on the on the uh, Delk prints uh, that uh, reveal how modern day creationists online are really prone to relying upon 
unchecked secondary sources. Um, uh, the matter about kinds, one kind turning into another kind uh, that clade starfish brings up. Uh, this is the, the thing that it's fun to see more and more people online using a source methods approach. When people bring up kinds, you go, oh, gee, uh, how many are there? Um, define kind. And then I'll jump in and say, and use it somewhere. Um, you'll find that the average creationist is stuck with the usual tropes, dogs. Well, one dog, dog breeds, dogs, followed by dogs, and then we'll discuss dogs. And after that, maybe some dogs. Uh, you're not going to find them talking about myocids. You're not going to find them talking about the systematics of basal carnivores and how uh, the cats, felids, and the canids uh, developed, and they're not going to be paying attention to the fossil data. But beyond that, there's all the rest of the fossil record to contend with. And uh, uh, we've got, um, oh, Korag, um, uh, if that number that you put up, 17,771 is the number of kinds, uh, or uh, that that's an interesting. Um, uh, creationists are kind of all over the map on this. Uh, it's essentially guesstimation. Uh, some numbers have been as high as 8,500. Um, the ones that used on the Ark Encounter apparently are down to about 1,500. What the problem is is to get a list. Can you list them? And uh, there's a, a picture at the... Um, Ark encounter of the number of kinds on the Ark. And unfortunately, it's not a high resolution picture. So there's names, boom, 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 boom. You can see the headings, and I was able to spot what the headings were in the picture that I've seen. But other than just blur, I can't tell specifically what's below it. But apparently, they've got the therapsids that are all separate kinds. And uh, um, they, they did indicate which groups were extinct or not. And it turns out that 54% of the taxa on their own list go extinct. Oh, that's not a very good preservation rate <laughs> for the ark that was supposed to preserve everything. So um, uh, they don't really ponder that too much. But I'd still love to see the exact names. And it's revealing that they've never done any papers on it. I haven't, it, if anybody has spotted anything at Answers in Genesis in their research journal or anywhere else where they've actually gone into justifying how they arrived at these conclusions. And are they paying attention to all the data to do it? Um, I haven't seen anything yet. Um, Brian says, as near as I can tell, it's a taxon somewhere between life and species, but never the same one. Um, I'll, I'll say this, that, that the, the, the tradition has been remarkably static. By and large, the traditional definition of kind meant what we would call family systematically. And this has been true way back. Um, oh, Harriet Ritvo wrote a book on um, uh, systematics and uh, creationist systematics uh, in tr history. Um, I think I've got it in the uh, Peacock and something or other. It's in my bibliography. Uh, anyway, uh, 1997, I think she wrote it. And uh, that hasn't changed much. Even modern creationists, when they, when they start getting lucid, will acknowledge that more or less the family level is where they envisage kinds. But they've got some problems in other areas because they can't ever allow us to follow under that rule. Otherwise, we're with the primates, Bonzo, the chimp, and the orangutans, and that won't work. So we have to be a species all of our own. And for all practical purposes, that's the only one there. Um, beyond that, there are an awful lot of little fussy phyla that might be a little tricky to deal with. And so they might have to deal with uh, larger groups, uh, orders, and that. Um, but again, they don't deal with a hell of a lot of the paleontology here. Uh, typically, the implication that I've seen on dinosaurs is they're running pretty much at the family level. But that's a huge amount of taxa within there. And so now they've got the problem of trying to square that with the common creationists who are insisting for all practical purposes that speciation doesn't happen at all. You find this over and over again where... Um, there's a creationist who had lobbed a video to me, and so I'm. Uh, it was a new person that I wasn't aware of before, and it turns out they're acknowledging, yeah, the uh, species aren't kinds. Kinds are bigger. They're the family level. They ex accept that, and then he makes the mistake of actually authority quoting of all people, Jonathan Wells, um, on um, uh, the uh, species matter, and it sounds like Wells is saying that speciation doesn't happen at all. In which case, uh, where the heck is our uh, kinds going? Because you'd have to have species on the ark. So within their own 
apologetics of what they're stealing and what they're not, they don't seem to realize that they're trying to square data fields that aren't fitting. And they never quite hear it quite enough. Um, Clay says, some I don't think the desert herders of the Bible cared much about Bryce Owens. Uh, yeah, and you wouldn't expect them to. Um, that there's a relatively small number of animals that are mentioned in the Bible at all. And duh, they're all animals that are like around the barnyard and animals that they would be familiar with. And then there are some mythic ones like Behemoth and Leviathan that are have, have, um, uh, mythological characters. Leviathan kind of traces back to an old um, Indo-European monster, kind of like a Hydra thing that ran around and run amok. And it may also have connected up uh, with any big sea creature, whale lore and that. But remember, the, 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 um, the Jews weren't sea people. They were inland. They were wandering herders. And they glommed on to traditions that they found, presumably if they had any experience with the Egyptians as, say, uh, uh, an enslaved people, which is uncertain, uh, or new people who were, or other cultures. They definitely bumped into the Babylonian legends when they were in the Babylonian captivity. So there's a lot of cross-fertilization that's going on in the pre-internet Bronze Age when people communicated by legends and folk tales and stuff around the campfire and all of that. Um, but bit by bit, um, the data field, the more we know about the data field and the more we are aware of how little that data field gets noticed by the creationists, and all of this is source methods, um, I think the more effective we can be, not in changing the mind of the average creationist, they're Tortukans, they don't change their mind, but by bearing honest witness and the people who are fence straddlers who are not quite certain and like to think that they really want to be scientific, maybe prodded to start thinking more about it. And that's the road that they'll be going off into the direction of actually figuring out how everything works. Um, the, um, the re continuing refrain that I've been doing in this series, and if it gets boring, well, I'm sorry, it's the continuing refrain because it's the whole point why I'm doing this, is that source methods is the ultimate weapon against incorrect viewpoints, that um, you can argue that everybody makes mistakes, I put, as I put it in my old uh, tip work, to err is human, but to correct requires sound method. And it's that sound method part that is gotten kind of shuffled to the side. Uh, sound method is not involving accepting authorities unchecked. Quite to the contrary, everything can be checked. And you gradually build up a, a set of expertise about who is a reliable source or not. But that doesn't mean that they can't screw up on some technical issue. Everybody can make some mistakes. But ultimately, you want to ground things in primary source data field. And we have the spectacular advantage in the 21st century to have access to most of the technical literature free. We don't have to go scavenging around in college libraries the way I used to do, where I'd have to photocopy articles, hard copy, that the vast majority of this stuff is accessible online, 80% easy. So there's no excuse whatsoever in the mouse click era that you can't obtain this information. And it's also a technique of getting more and more people familiar with the technical literature. If you're going to dive into creation evolution issues, you jolly well better up your game so that you can't ever be blindsided by some creationist who is tossing jargon at you to where you know what they're talking about. Because that's how you can be thrown off um, in debates or in interactions where suddenly you have to all get blustery because you've been blindsided by some obscure technical point that they hadn't dealt with. Um, the utility of seeing primary sources, the ones I link to, and I'd love to get feedback about how many people actually follow up on, on the links and see what they do. Are they useful or not? Give me some feedback on this, gang. Um, but the, the thing is, is that don't be intimidated. I've done a thing before with Brooke uh, on the show where I said, don't be intimidated by source citations. It, it doesn't mean that, that uh, you'll understand everything all in one fell swoop, but the very act of looking at a technical paper to see how much do you understand of it? How easily are you following the line of argument? How easily are you seeing how they make use of source citations and the different elements that different disciplines use as to how they cite technical literature? 
and then to see how much documentation is required for particular points or not. How recent is the material? And then follow up on areas where you go, that sounds interesting. Well, look up the source that they cite, track that down, see if you can locate it. If you can't, that's a problem, but you probably won't find that issue coming up in regular peer-reviewed stuff because the material is correct. Um, which will bring us to our second half of the show. Um, uh, uh, B, uh, BJ says, uh, uh, they look at some of the links, uh, tend not to read the creationist stuff, but uh, like the actual research links. I'm okay with that. Um, I put the creationist stuff in there because I want you to be able to, in principle, see their stuff too. Um, you'll notice that an awful lot, not all, but a lot of creationist or ideological um, propaganda type stuff will criticize people from afar and not provide a link to them. Uh, this isn't true of all types. Uh, the, the Discovery Institute, for example, and most of what goes on at the ICR and AIG will produce links to the material uh, that they're criticizing. And that's fair, although don't take their word for it. So the more you track down what people are saying versus what actually is being said, I stand by my material. And I would contend that if anybody can find me misrepresenting source material, call it to my attention. But I try to be really scrupulously fair with stuff, never overstep the bounds of data field. Uh, always know what the data field is, though. So instead of bogging down on issues like the origin of life matter, which is very problematic, or even something like the Cambrian explosion, where you've got an awful lot of question marks and holes in your data field, uh, focus in on stuff that we don't have holes in, like the reptile-mammal transition, like paleogenomics, uh, the uh, a practical utility of evolution, the abject failure of anti-evolution to, to be useful, even in their own context. Uh, they've never been very good at um, anticipating life. They've never been very good. Uh, they've been good at post hoc rationalization. Probably their biggest bugbear is the junk DNA matter, where they really are committed. Intelligent designers in particular are really committed to the idea that every bit of DNA is functional. And the idea that any of it isn't suggests a designer that's kind of inattentive, eccentric. And uh, it's not that large swaths of non-coding DNA don't do stuff, and they're working it out more and more all the time. It's that it's no mandate that everything do something that you can easily find an intron uh, that is not doing a damn thing. It's there just accidentally because of the foam on the beer process of all this mechanical, non-conscious, non-directed, non-teleological genetic system that's foaming and churning and modifying and mutating and doing its thing. And if anything seriously goes wrong with the mutation, boop, it's edited out because it drops dead and never has babies. Uh, so it's a self-correcting system that way. But ALUs are a perfectly fine example. There, there are over a million of them in our DNA, and they're growing all the time uh, because they have a copy me code. And I've never seen any indication to suggest that all of them do stuff. And some of them that do, they're just as likely to be causing diseases. They can be functional in some contexts. In other contexts, they can be dangerous. They can cause all sorts of problems. So um, if, if you're going to attribute design to the good stuff, you've got to design attribute the bad stuff to. Um, immutable Destiny says, anti-evolution is just good at rattling attention. It keeps resurrecting itself and it doesn't need to. It's something that's very attractive to the mindset that needs to have it be true. They don't want human beings to be evolved critters. And that's the core problem that has been obsessive in anti-evolutionism from the get-go. It wasn't whether trilobites evolved or whether dinosaurs uh, developed uh, naturally, it's that we have to be special. And it relates to the theological imperatives that Christianity in particular have about uh, the fall of Adam and the sin death and the resurrection uh, of Jesus as a payment of the debt and all that. There, there's a whole um, theological baggage that's non-negotiable, that's at the core of the religion. And the idea that humans have been knocking around for hundreds of thousands of years without God paying any attention to them um, is really unattractive to them. So they have to not think about that or get rid of it somehow or other. They have to unplug humans from the mix. They could do that more easily in the 19th century because there was so little data on human evolution at that time. Neanderthals was it. And then in the very end of the century, they started finding the first of what we now call uh, Homo erectus, uh, Peking man and uh, Java man. 
and uh, is really then in the 20s when they started finding more material in Africa. And then after World War II, things kicked in with a vengeance. So that by the time I was reaching the issues in the 60s and 70s on, um, it was impossible to disconnect human evolution from general evolution. So modern creationist apologetics cannot take the road that some anti-evolutionists were doing a century earlier, where they could say, okay, maybe evolution for plants or hyenas, but not for people. No, it's a package deal that the same principles that cause us to understand that, it, that any organism has evolved applies to us too. And if that's theologically unacceptable to them, they're going to have to dig their heels in. But even if they don't discuss human evolution up front, it's not far from their mind. And they may be talking about trilobites, but it's in order to dislodge that connective section. So they're forced functionally to reject all of, of macroevolution uh, in order to keep the human thing separate. Um, Immutable Destiny says that uh, I don't think many people argue design. The intelligent aspect is where it gets itself in a jumble. Evolutionary developmental biology seems to show that gene network activations relate to morphology. Oh, yeah. Well, every remember, every single thing that you see in the living world is due ultimately to a series of DNA codes. But it's figuring out how all of those interact that makes it fun and interesting. Uh, the old days where they were thinking old days, huh, pre-1980s, uh, when they were thinking that there would be one gene per protein. It turned out to be wrong. That was, um, um, they discovered alternative splicing. And in fact, it's far more exciting and wacky and less plausible from a design perspective in how the same genes, the genetic information can code for multiple genes. A bit of it this way will make one gene of protein. A bit of it that way will make another protein. And you read it backwards and it can make a different protein. That's because of all the interchangeable parts and all the mutant versions of interchangeable parts and mutant versions where things are plugged together from modules to make more interchangeable parts. And this is um, a weird thing from a design perspective. It's understandable if what you've got is this seething cauldron of genetic development where Things are replicating and mutating and cross-checking and doing all of this stuff at blinding speed. And the end result is whatever works. And over time, new things develop that work. And uh, you end up with um, very, very different things over time, even though most life stays pretty much stuck in a rut. But it's the variations, the relatively rare deviations that are intriguing, and we're one of them. Um, uh, Brooks says pre-1980s is as old as I am. 28 was born in 1990. Yeah, I keep on forgetting uh, a lot of that in terms of how uh, my perspective is very different from people today. I am an old fart. So I'm um, in uh, high school in the late 1960s. And I'm kind of glad that in many respects I didn't take biology then because I would have to unlearn a lot of the things that might have been put in the schools. Um, uh, it's not that they were flamingly wrong, it's that there were a lot of pieces missing. So homeobox genes and a lot of what we now know about developmental biology, the, the, the actual number of genes in a genome, uh, the alternative splicing stuff, uh, the layer on layer of, of protein coding genes, uh, coding genes and cis-regulatory genes and then homeobox body plan things and all of these things are interacting. None of that was known until the 1990s on. So only within the lifetimes of relatively young people have so much of that come into play. Um, that our modern conception of genetics is newer than plate tectonics, which was coming in in the 1970s. So um, there's a lot of revolutions that's been going on in here. And it's an exciting time to live. I, I love the amount of science that's going on. And, and don't get me going on astronomy. Holy moly. I was gobsmacked to, to realize that I lived to the time when we actually know that there are planets around other solar systems. That that was a completely speculative thing when I was growing up. Alpha Centauri was this distant set of stars and I had to only speculate. This was in the 80s where I was just wondering, you know, would there be planets around it and what kind? Now we can actually see them with our instruments. Wow, that's absolutely amazing. And of course, it's more data for creationists to avoid. Um, 
Uh, Korak says, creationists must find it incredibly demoralizing to learn that it doesn't take a transcendent force to create stars and planets and black holes in the first cell. There's no need for a god. Um, it's um, a thing that, that reinforces how natural everything else is that there's a certain degree, we're very um, anthropocentric. We like to think it's all about us. Uh, and um, from our perspective, it is all about us, but we're just a tiny slice of life on the planet. And our planet is just one of um, apparently dead planets everywhere else in the solar system. Although who knows, we'll have to still look to find out, but I'm not holding my breath on life on Europa or something like that, but I'd be delighted if there is. Um, and then you've got all of that within the frame of stars so abundant in the universe that they are as abundant as grains of sand on a beach. And the idea that no life anywhere in all of that vast array, wow. Uh, the L L airway line from uh, contact where it'd be a terrible waste of space. <laughs> uh, that um, the difficulty is that any life forms, even bacteria, if life is relatively finicky as to where it's going to arise, it could mean it's incredibly rare, even if it's fantastically abundant. If there was one um, life-bearing planet on average per galaxy, that's pretty bleak, um, there would be hundreds of billions of planets with life on them, but we're never going to bump into them because they're too far away. So there's a frustration about it. There's a sense of isolation and loneliness. Uh, it's as if you were sitting on the crag and, and you're, wherever you look, there's no other people. Um, that we're able to bump into other people and find connectivity with life. But it's an intimidating thought to think about how inhospitable most of the universe is. And uh, we, we've had to go through these gear shifts before because in the old days, they thought it was a flat earth and the whole universe was just a firmament that was not that far away. Uh, the idea that it was vastly large and vastly old wasn't a common notion. And we've been knocking ourselves uh, into the cocked hat for quite some time when we discovered that the, the little twinkly lights were actually stars. And that eventually when that nebula in Andromeda wasn't just a cloud of stuff, it was another galaxy of stars a million and a half light years away. And that there were in fact as many galaxies of stars as there are stars in our galaxy. How can you not feel humbled by that? It's, it's astonishing and amazing. If, if you want to attribute it to, to a God, fine and Andy, but boy, it's a God that spends a lot of time on stuff other than us. So that also undermines the specialness feature. Um, if we ever bumped into any alien life forms, it'd be fascinating to know if they have religions or not. Um, are they so anatomically and biologically different in terms of their evolutionary history that they missed that? Uh, we don't know. We haven't bumped into any. Um, immutable destiny. The difficulty with life is it's exceptionally sensitive to initial formation states. If you're too far away from a solar body and revolution period isn't short enough, goodbye life, yeah. Uh, we don't know, given that we only have this one example, um, we have no um, way of knowing how um, atypical we are. Oh, um, I, I'm, I've been dithering on here. I, I need to put in my uh, uh, late um, shameless plug and comment on um, our uh, Patreon people. So let's put our little showtime on here. And uh, there's my patrons. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. Uh, um, I think I may have gotten past the thing of figuring out how to get the money from uh, the donations that have been coming in. I'll find out uh, more officially uh, in the beginning of February if, when I see what materializes and what doesn't. But we have our colleagues, Andrew and Hendrel and Eric, and our researchers, Keith and Fino and Brad and Ralph and Meet and Pologia, Hi, Pologia, Sur and Zeshi. And assistant researchers, Dire Wolf and Doranku and Nyanya and Staggles and Suras, who's helping with the audiobook of Paralogues of Fog, uh, and Totus Real, and our friends, Eat and Stephen, and uh, who is in the live chat as we uh, watch, uh, Marigail Beddoes and Daniel and Bo and Alex and Paul, and our legacy patrons. These are people who helped in the past, whether or not the money ever ends up in my pocket or not. Uh, thank you anyway, Jen and John and Mona and Sun and Everett. Um, I'll, I'll point out uh, that um, uh, the um, uh, people who have been helping over the times in any way that you can, 
um, have edged me through one day, one week, one month at a time. And uh, I'm having a midlife crisis in my 60s. What can I do? Uh, but I'm having fun doing what I'm doing. And um, here, um, everybody that um, uh, is a supporter of the project, make sure everybody knows about TortukenWordPress.com. It's still a work in progress. I still have a lot of things to do to upgrade the the um, uh, WordPress page to get links in and things. And I've got tools that I still have to figure out how to use and all that. I'm still a novice in this. And I, it's not helped by the fact that I'm busy with the work all the time. So I, I sometimes can't spare the effort to do the housekeeping on some of these things. Um, for the Patreons uh, crowd, there's the patreon.com uh, downer tip. There's a link also in the video uh, description. And also gofundme.com to see go. That's another direct way to do. And you can do recurring things there as well. And um, uh, every little bit of that helps. I've been really lucky this month. I was having opportunity to have ink uh, so that I could actually print the incoming material rather than to put them into storage files, which is time consuming and awkward. So that's uh, helped you know, along enormously. Uh, the second half of the show relates to some creationist wacky. We're way past the second half of the show, but I want to call attention to it because sometimes I rattle on to the point where I forget to have noted the things that I linked in the second half. Um, some creationists along the way were insisting that um, there's some super duper facts that they had for me. And one of them was the um, Delk print which was one of these uh, things that creationists have been putting around about a human being in dinosaur tracks down in Paluxy. And, um, oh, uh, uh, Beach says, J-Mac has a question from above. Let me go up there. I find this fascinating, but no next to nothing, limited formal education. Is it true that many of the elements needed for life only form in supernova? I read that recently. Oh, yeah. Um, that I think uh, iron is kind of at the upper boundary of what form in normal novas. But some of the upper level uh, elements, and I think gold is one of them, um, if memory serves me or if anybody that's more technically proficient on that, I want to call attention to it. I'm kind of diving into it because of the creationism issue and nucleosynthesis. But the thing is that some of the ones take the energy of exploding stars or even colliding stars, and uh, they need that extra kick to reach the energy levels where they can form these higher level ones. And so that, that every single element that's in our body has an enormously long tradition to it. The hydrogen that formed the water and that shows up in our molecules was made in the Big Bang. We don't really make use of helium, so we don't have to worry about that. But all the major stuff, uh, carbon and others, are formed in the first stages of these nucleosynthesis and then cascaded out into space in supernovas. Then... Some of the other elements are made in second generation stars and because of um, uh, supernova and collisions and other features that, that can get that energy level. So it, we are, are walking a um, testament to a fantastically long history of the synthesis of, of nuclear elements. Young Earth creationists, needless to say, don't like that. So they want everything to be made magic-y all in one big go uh, at uh, 6,000 years ago, but that one uh, is not particularly. Um, yeah, but uh, Burke says, creation is being wacky. What a shock there. Yeah, uh, that happens. Um, and Clark says, it's a fact that without sun uh, is dying, supernova is happening and destroying galaxies, there would be no life in the universe. In fact, that leads us to a conclusion that you can't have life as we know it without all of those many billions of years of precursor. So you can't have intelligent life that is uh, 10 billion years old because the stuff that make them up don't exist yet. So um, if you look at it from that context, we're probably among the older intelligent life forms knocking around because we are the beneficiaries of all of those long processes that eventually form stellar systems that have planetary systems made with a lot of elements that make up the things that make up us. And then the resources that we have to do stuff to make up uh, uh, minerals and things to build our technology off of and build radio telescopes so that we can listen or make noisy sounds uh, at the universe to try to say, hi, we're here. Don't attack us if you're a nasty alien. Um, at some um, uh, Brian Stevens says, have to remember that supernova were occurring 12 billion years back. Yeah, the, the, the universe is a busy place and gravity does its thing. And remember, um, there, if you want to keep up with a lot of the literature, you don't necessarily have to ferret through 
uh, the, the super technical journals. But if you do as I do and follow science, nature, and the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, you'll tend to get more astrophysics, frankly, in science and nature uh, than you will in the PNAS. That's a bit more biologically oriented, but you do get some in that. Uh, and um, that will keep you up on a lot of the material. And you'll get, if you subscribe to Scientific American or, or online for that, uh, or any of these um, uh, kind of general summary style magazines, you'll, you'll pick up a lot of the material that way. You can keep your finger on the pulse of the science, which you need to do in order to keep one step ahead of the creationist, or better yet, five steps ahead of the creationist. Um, the... Um, uh, immutable but destiny, if you think about it, hydrogen is actually one of the last things to form from the early Big Bang. Deep proton, deuterium, and helium would form first. And indeed, even the old let there be light uh, analogy that the uh, old Earth creation has tried to latch on to, light actually isn't there to begin with either. That the universe uh, starts out as just mass energy. And then you actually, what happens, of course, this happens blindingly fast, you know, in fractions of a second in some cases. But the forces that, that make up stuff have to feed out as the universe expands and cools. So I think the first one that started to congeal out was gravity. And um, then um, uh, I can't remember whether it, uh, um, the uh, you've got strong and, and um, a weak, uh, the electroweak force, which is electromagnetism and the um, thing that causes radioactive decay. And then the strong nuclear force is the one that holds protons and neutrons and all, or, uh, stuff together in the atom. And uh, uh, each one of these things congealed outward with this big stuff of mass energy. And that as the forces began to act upon them, that's when it kind of settled down to the stuff that we then call light in electromagnetism and we call mass uh, made out of these little hadrons that are made out of vibrating uh, quarks that are probably vibrating strings that are made of something else and made of something else and who knows, turtles all the way down, who knows. Uh, that's why physics is so e extraordinarily fascinating. And um, that the mathematics of the physics that we know is able to work back to just a tiny fraction of a second after the singularity. There's still debates going on as to what was happening before that. And at that point, the formulas go tilt and it becomes very advanced mathematics that makes for cute graphics and, and fascinatingly abstruse papers in technical literature. But nonetheless, you can't resolve. But that doesn't mean all the stuff that happened after that wasn't very, very natural and physiological. Uh, physiolog uh, physically uh, rigorous. Uh, Korag says, again, water is required for life, and as far as we know, there's no need for a transcendent hand to guide hydrogen and oxygen molecules to form water. It's a basic process. Indeed. In fact, oxygen um, is the, the, the nasty one here because it's got a very promiscuous nature. It just loves filling out its electron shells. And so it links on to stuff with a vengeance and uh, rusts out oceans and does all sorts of things. It's a very dangerous, corrosive substance there. And that water stuff, you know, you take that in sufficient quantity and it can kill you. So, uh, and yet we're dependent on it. Um, so the, the, the wonderful dance of life, that if you have a teleological mind that wants to imply that there is a purpose to all of that, isn't it nice God designed hydrogen atoms so they can mate with oxygen? Isn't that sweet? Well, did he have any choice? Uh, were, were there were there any tweakable knobs in the how to make a universe kit? Uh, we don't know because we don't have any other universes to look at. But if a lot of it is absolutely dictated physics, then there's no fine tuning. There's no tweaking. There's no decision to make the carbon um, atom any differently than it can. There's no uh, uh, alteration as to whether you can change the gravitational constant or not. It may be absolutely necessary. It may be unavoidable. And it may not even be tweakable by gods, but that's into metaphysics and you can't get around all of that. Um, any other questions knocking around in here? The, on, on the, uh, the, the first bit about the, the Delk print, you can look up the um, uh, creationist material and the uh, non-creationist material talking about that. And you can make up your own mind as to how probable it is that a barefoot person was traipsing around next to a dinosaur. Um, what? 4,500 years ago, uh, before the flood. But the other one that was really fun was um, uh, a, a particularly loudmouth creationist who threw the Wasserberger quote at me, which was a geologist supposedly admitting that the uh, wrong radiometric dates were being tossed out. And uh, it was very fun to do. In fact, I, um, the that's from 
the fellow in question couldn't offer a source for it, but I tracked the thing down because it turns out apparently only one creationist has ever made this claim. And that's this uh, Ralph Matthews, Radiometric Dating in the Age of the Earth from 1982. And um, it's got a, um, a, a series of authority quotes and stuff. And the one that came up in, um, uh, in a recent article in Science entitled Timekeepers of the Solar System, footnote 33. Leading rock dater Wasserberger is reported to have said, we're building a new generation of fairy castles and myths for the next generation to play with. Ooh. Well, when you look down in footnote 33, it says science, page 55, May, June, 1980. What is not said in this article is that the other ages range from 2 to 28 billion years have been obtained. Tiny problem. What is this science, May, June, 1980? Science Magazine isn't a monthly or a bi or a May Juni. It's a weekly. Uh, which science is it? That's page 55. I could not find any information whatsoever for this. And if anyone can track down this, there actually is a geologist named Wasserberg. No Berger. It's, he doesn't got an ER on the ALM. In fact, I got a bunch of his stuff in my technical literature. And um, that even under that thing, I can't find any indication of where this is. It wouldn't surprise me that in a jocular way, when they're talking about a particular matter of radiometric dating and others, that um, he said the character string that is attributed to him. But I'd love to see the context. And when I went through and looked up all of his sources, I found that he was playing fast and loose with stuff. Uh, Matthews had a point where he was going... Um, their, uh, the primordial concentrations of isotopes is an intractable problem, and the value chosen can only be based on assumptions. And even the invariance of decay constants is now under question. And he listed a whole slew of five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, uh, foot, uh, the footnotes of those. And when I looked them up, a bunch of them were letters to the editor. They weren't about radiometric dating per se. They were completely off in a completely different ballpark. Uh, and uh, the stuff from uh, the... Uh, um, uh, chemical and engineering news and that. Um, they weren't challenging the decay rates. So Matthews either doesn't know how to read or got this material secondarily from somebody else who doesn't know how to read or somebody along the way didn't care what the text said and made it act as if it wasn't. In any case, we got a problem on here. So this all goes back to the exciting world of what it means to do sound scholarship and how you can make use of the tools that are available online to track stuff down, even in clumsy oaf land where the source material is very vague. He was particularly frustrating for me because he never gave any of the titles of the piece. He just would list off Barton, Jr., uh, I.M., Canad, J., Earth Sciences, 14, 1641, 1977. And you have to kind of ferret backwards to find out what that referred to, to find out even what the topic was. Uh, that can take some time to do, but it's useful because sometimes you'll hit pay dirt where you can get the full text and you can see what it is they're supposedly relying on, and then you can cross-check that against their claims and find out whether or not they're making a mistake or not. Um, Immutable Destiny says, amazingly, most bacteria fixate nitrogen, which is a hell of a process. Yeah, the, there's, uh, the deep structure of bacterial life on which all of us depend uh, dates back a way long way. And it's still uncertain because you can't go on fossil data. A bacterium that you would find as a fossilized form, you might be able to generally classify it. But the only way you can look at some of these biological processes is by their byproducts. Uh, if you think about the what comes out as waste products in the nitrogen fixation process, that may be determined by what isotopes are used. And then you can measure the isotopes in the rocks and find out whether or not they mix, match up with this process or not, that you would find an abundance of particular isotopes that are preferentially used. We find that with carbon uh, processes and, and uh, photosynthetic processes that uh, arbitrarily prefer one isotope over another. Uh, and that by measuring that, you can find the secondary smoking gun clues or smocking gun, if you follow the president, uh, clues to what's going on there. And um, the deep biologic systems there are things that I bump into um, as origins issues because the, the very deep systems of how metabolism works. Um, photosynthesis is apparently fairly late in the game. 
um, it's uh, you find cyanobacteria like a billion and a half years or more after life originated. Um, you may have found that there's a good argument to be made. The chemosynthetic systems are the ones that start off uh, initially. Nitrogen, by the way, uh, would have been a relatively abundant element in our atmosphere, uh, although a lot of it would have to be cycled down into the oceans um, as a result of that. So there's a, a bunch of intermediaries going on. And a lot of this depends on what elements were available as um, uh, eroded material from rocks. And it's, it, it's a fascinating process. And if you read the various early life work um, uh, that's coming in the, in the modern uh, technical literature, they're, they're thinking about all these neat little problems and figuring out, oh, did we leave that part out? Uh, that if, if you're missing a particular element, it may make a great difference as to how likely certain processes can for developing. Um, whether or not all of these deep, deep, deep systems uh, will be uh, figured out within my lifetime, I don't know. Um, I think something that's closer to home, the uh, proto-HOX uh, genes, uh, that's something that I might live long enough for them to have figured out what the hell was the thing from which the HOX genes and the para-HOX genes develop, which are at the root of body patterning in most of the animal phyla, uh, if not all the animal phyla. So these are things that are um, ongoing, fascinating issues. Uh, the time after that, you know, the last half billion years, uh, oh gosh, that's well known. And uh, which is the reason why I discuss a bunch of that stuff in Evolution of Slam Dunk, uh, which brings me back to um, that. Uh, well, Korak says, you look at the Titanic, which is a mile and a half below the surface being consumed by those amazing bacteria turning into a stalactite cave. Um, Although there are other spots, amazingly, they when they found, um, 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 I think it was the Indianapolis uh, that was in a, a different set of circumstances to where basically it's an anoxic zone and um, nothing is interfering with it. There's still, still wood on the uh, boat. So it's in a very different environment out there in the Pacific at a different depth that's anoxic in a way that the super deep ocean um, is able to have little bacteria that can live there in part because they probably don't get eaten by anything else uh, because it's it's down so far and they can make use of what they have. Uh, RJ bots uh, bought back, um, I'm not sure what that refers to, uh, Brian, uh, meets all search requirements. The uh, I'll have to, I'll have to investigate what the Garfield Library UPenn EDU thing is. So I'm not entirely sure what that refers to. Um, the, um, yeah, I'll have to check that reference on page 510 uh, in, in due course to find out what we're all referring on. But anyway, the, the fascinating amount of biological work that's around these days is just gobsmacking. And I'm like a kid in a candy store. Uh, sometimes it distracts me because I'll find some new piece of information that pops along. Plus, I'm jousting with creationists all the time, so that uh, takes up some effort uh, to deal with. Because uh, and and getting more people involved in the uh, the source methods campaign. Uh, a thing to do is what I call an enfilade, uh, which is when you are seeing uh, some example of creation is stupid, and instead of just you doing it all on your own, if you have groups that can go in there and instead of any ad hominem attack against uh, the creationists, no, what you're using is the issues they bring up as an opportunity to talk the science. And so you can go on now in a conversation between literate people that's non-confrontational because you're actually talking about the science and all of those creationists in the tags are unwitting bystanders to your discussion. And you'll probably find if you're talking technical material, they ain't going to jump in. Oh, they would have to know something about it. But the point is, is if there's anybody in the field that is unaware or a fence straddler, hopefully some of them are going to start to look at this information that's brought up and have the spark of interest uh, shown. So don't worry about trying to... Um, uh, convince the diehard creationists that they're wrong, they're, that's not going to work. They're not going to look at any of the data. They're conceptually blinded on these things. And that's that's the typical one. But there will be ones that may have been raised in a creationist environment. They may not realize that it's out there and they suddenly have the epiphany. Wow, I didn't know about that stuff. And you can play a role in that. 
uh, plus the, the discussion of the technical science, and that's really quite fascinating, or as well the uh, uh, cultural uh, matter as well. Remember, everybody can pick my brain too on social media. So if you're on Twitter um, and you have a question for me, lob it at me uh, and uh, let it go on that. Uh, and then, of course, all the comments that occur on the videos. I try to keep up with that as much as possible. Uh, and there's uh, creationist C. Brown, I'm imagining, will be putting some snarky comments on the videos. He does that periodically and repeats the same shtick over and over and over again. And uh, he's an, un an unpersuadable, too. Uh, yeah, Gerald Wassenberg, Brian, yes. Uh, Caltech, directing the Library of Geological Science. I've got a bunch. He's been doing work for years. And uh, um, um, he's been a, a major character in the field. And uh, it makes it, therefore, very suspicious that the person allegedly quoting him can't even spell his name correctly. So uh, there's an awful lot of, of problem. But, and the fact that it doesn't show up much. Uh, I can only find one creationist website that repeated the Wasser Berger quote. Uh, oh, Brooke Bur says, do not mention C. Brown. Last time you did, he showed up in the chat. Oh, if he wants to, he, he can show up. He can come into the chat, find it handy. He keeps on asking if he want, uh, that I should, he should bring him on the show again. And I go, no. You, you couldn't behave when you were on before. You won't answer questions. Uh, you won't discuss stuff. You just want to blither blather on. And I, if I want to have somebody on the, if I have a creationist in my uh, field, I want to discuss source methods with them. And if they can't do that, well, that's their problem. But um, uh, if you want, uh, so, so it sounded like C was going to write a paper and submit it to the proceedings of the Royal Academy of Sciences. I think he misunderstood what he meant to say on that. I think he was meaning some paper that he had seen there or something. But anyway, if he ever writes such a paper, gosh, I'll want to see it. I think all of us will want to see that. That will go right next to Edgar, Mr. Intelligent Design's uh, works uh, as, as works of, of interest. Uh, anyway, oh, Brian, yes, you're almost in time to see me show uh, uh, shut the show down. <laughs> a little bit late, but... Uh, I started a little bit late anyway. It's been a, a, a busy little thing going along. I've got a huge backlog of technical information that came in. Uh, there was a paper uh, from 2009 that's probably we're going to want to include in the human evolution section that, that's riffing off of Sanford's genetic entropy arguments and, and um, uh, claiming that um, human haplotypes are actually derived from the flood time on. And uh, he had a lot of technical papers in there. It's a mass of stuff about linkage, linkage disequilibrium. Boy, my tongue is getting tangled up today, uh, which I uh, didn't have a great deal on in my tip data field. And so I was doing some crash research on that and tracking down the primary sources. And I was, getting, I was able to get the vast majority of his technical papers in full text. And I'll be analyzing those in due course where I can see what he's making use of them. So um, uh, there's a lot of work and things to go on on a lot of different subject matter. And we're past the hour here, and um, uh, I've uh, dealt with that. Um, I put up my shameless plug, and I'll put up a shameless plug again. Everybody who does not have uh, Evolution Slam Dunk, please get it. Uh, if you are a current reader, let people know about it. Um, ask your library if they're going to get it. Uh, if you know scientists in other fields, if you know people that are critics of creationism, they say, hey, have you read Slam Dunk? And if not, say, oh, gosh, you need to and so forth and so on, because I'm very proud of the work. It filled a hole that hadn't been done before, uh, and that's why I wrote it. So you can find out all of that spectacular reptile mammal transition and all of the creationists who crash and burn on it. Michael Denton, all the Intelligent Design Gang, Philip Johnson, uh, uh, John Woodmarap, Dwayne Gish. Um, there's stuff that's uh, from the 1980s on, and it's 100% failure rate. So once you get armed with the RMT and you know all the field in there, you will literally know every counter argument the creationists can offer against it. And you can either force them off the field because they can't deal with it, or they'll think to come in and talk about some of the John Woodmarap's paper or something like that, and you can buzzsaw them with the, uh, the detailed facts. So anyway, that's the end of that. And uh, we got another day out of the way uh, on... Uh, uh, Evolution Hour. Everybody that is in spots that's freezing cold, which looks like most of the east of the United States, uh, be super duper careful. Bundle up. Watch about um, um, driving and going out. Uh, try to stay indoors as much as possible. Make sure if you've got fuel um, issues that you can make sure that you can get access to it. How they're doing for um, uh, emergency access and hospital access. And oh, I mean, it, this is creepy. Uh, I've been through an ice storm. 
here in Spokane and, and it can drive the thing to a halt. It can drop, pull down power lines. And a lot of these things can have long-term effects that go on for weeks and months. In some cases, areas up in the South Hill uh, here in Spokane took months uh, to get their power back because it was so difficult getting in the, uh, the uh, these narrow streets and things to repair them. So uh, everybody uh, be very, very careful and um, uh, proceed accordingly. And then we'll all be looking forward to President Trump's uh, State of the Union message this coming Tuesday. Yay! Okay. Uh, see you all next week, gang. And um, um, uh, keep fighting the good fight and uh, take care. And uh, remember, we're in a golden age of science and I want our elected officials to be as informed as uh, any reasonably informed person would be. And unfortunately, at the moment, that's not the case. <laughs> Bye.